There are many, many times in my life where I've been an unknowing fool. Now, a few weeks back, I described my unfortunate experience of confusing a breast pump with an instrument of worship. But if you, and if you'd like to hear that story, you can go back and look at the transcript, and we can get you one. Now, I've had other moments in my life as well. 
Now, most of us have, have those words that we read in, 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 in children's books that we, we never, or as, chi- as a child, that we never learn to pronounce as an adult. Um, as a public speaker, this can be an especially embarrassing as you're trying to sound competent as like, a, well, say for instance, in my case, a young preacher. I remember describing Jesus, uh, Jesus' use of hyperbole in a text and actually had an English teacher kind of burst out laughing in the middle of my sermon as I was progressing. Now, one of my worst moments of being an unknowing fool came during a candidating weekend uh, at a church that I served. Now, the sermon was, was great. I didn't slip up when it came to my words. I added appropriate amounts of both passion and humor, and I, I walked away feeling like I did pretty well. And now, small churches often fail to have great systems in place for, for calling pastors, and First Baptist Church of Goodland, Kansas was no different. And after I finished preaching, the church actually sent Alice and I down into the basement, and we waited while the church upstairs voted on whether or not to call us as their pastor. So we were kind of down there planning our exit strategy and which door we might take if the vote was negative, when I decided, you know what, it's time for me to go to the bathroom. And so I walked into the restroom, looked down, and realized that I had preached the, my entire candidating sermon with my zipper down. Now, being an unknowing fool is rough, but in certain cases, it can be tragic, as we're going to be finding out in our text today. And so we're working through the book of Luke, and we're currently uh, on chapter on the 12th chapter. And so if you brought your Bibles, or you have them at home, we'd encourage you to turn there, and we're going to start reading in verse 13. It says this, Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God had said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. And so Jesus was approached by a man, uh, by a man to perform a duty that rabbis occasionally did. Now, we live in a massive country with an enormous judicial infrastructure. We have local judges, court systems, even in a Supreme Court to settle matters with at least apparent finality. Most people groups, though, throughout history have been much smaller, and often the role of settling a dispute might fall on a village elder, an appointed wise man. In Jewish cultures, rabbis weigh in on, would often weigh in on judicial matters within, within a community. And so this man's request wasn't completely out of the blue. What was different was the man's stance in approaching Jesus. Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, it wasn't, Jesus, would you sit down with my older brother and our family and assist us in settling our father's estate? It was a command to Jesus to do what the younger brother wanted to see happen. Now, unfortunately, even in biblical times, the settling of an estate is not always simple. And when tempers flare and injustice is perceived or even occurs, what should be a celebration can quickly turn into a business transaction with family members who may never again want to see one another. Uh, The man didn't want peace. He wanted property. And Jesus saw right through what was going on. Now, the man's eyes were on the things of the world, and Jesus was going to take this request as an opportunity to teach his disciples and the crowds about the only riches that eternally matter. And so he does this by describing an extreme scenario about a rich man and his financial conundrum. Now, he was wealthy, and he was a wealthy, unknowing fool who had it all, but discovered ultimately that it amounted to nothing. Now, the parable starts with a problem that most of us wouldn't see as a problem, right? The man had so many resources, he didn't know where to put them all. He inherited a farm with an incredibly fertile land, and on this particular year, he had a tremendous crop. 
There was no local co-op to store all the produce and grain or sell it all to at once. Um, and, and no other rich man had the barns capable of holding it either. And so he was in a pickle because he didn't have any place to store his excess. So he had a much needed conversation with the most important person in his life. And so scripture says, he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store for all my wheat and all my goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for many years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now if we're honest, many of us have had conversations similar to this in our own lives, right? Self, I think I'd like to get a new fishing boat, but my wife would rather get a new kitchen. Self, maybe we should be a little extra helpful around the house for the next couple of weeks. Maybe leave my tackle box next to the door to subliminally prepare her for my request. Now, in Middle Eastern culture, this would have been ludicrous. Like Kenneth Bailey describes how this would have been viewed through a Middle Easterner's eyes. He says, this is a very sad scene. In the Middle East, village people make decisions about important topics after long discussions with friends. Families and communities and villages are knit tightly together. Everybody's business is everybody else's business. Even trivial decisions are made, are made after hours of discussion with family and friends. But this man appears to have no friends. He lives in isolation, away from, from, from the human family around him. And with an important decision to make, the only person with whom he can have a dialogue with is himself. Now, we entertain ourselves in our culture into isolation, but their entertainment was about the community and the village that they were a part of. Decisions could, could take months to years to talk through within a community. You didn't want to rush them because part of the fun and the, it was the attention and the discussion with your friends and your relatives. The man is excessively wealthy, but when he looks around for someone to process his conundrum, conundrum with, there's no one available. Now, regardless of his apparent tragedy, he happily comes up with an exciting solution. What do you need when you discover excess? More space. Brilliant. You tear down your old barns and you build new ones. Apparently, the crop was so incredible that after he did the math, the man figured that this might be the one that takes him over the top. After the barns were built and the grain was stored, his working days would be over. He could sit back, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Unfortunately for this man, he wouldn't be around to enjoy the crop he was so excited about. Now, the man didn't have anyone in community to speak into his life, and so finally the Lord decided to step in and confront the man's insanity. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything that you worked for? All of his work, all of his planning, and all of his excitement are going to amount to absolutely nothing. He has no one to hand his wealth over to, no one surrounding him as he dies, and all he stored up will pass on to the first person who finds it. Eternally, he has nothing. He never used what he had to invest in anyone other than himself. His wealth pushed him away from others into greater and greater isolation. Now, it's not like this is some sort of ancient problem, right? Mansions are built on acres of property, surrounded by fences and gates intended to keep others away. Even, the more, even in more densely populated cities, skyscrapers uh, contain certain floors with exclusive elevator access, protecting the homeowner from, the, from, the, from other people to ensure their privacy. There are museums open to, to the public of former multimillionaires that became reclusive, paranoid, and maybe even borderline insane. Google the Winchester Mansion for an example of what I'm talking about. But before we dismiss this problem as an issue with other people, we need to remember that we live in an affluent culture we're the richest nation in all of human history, and most citizens in the country are within the top 10% wage earners in the world. Many of us would like a little acreage to spread out and enjoy. We, we, we use our resources to be self-sufficient. We want one of everything and possibly a few backups just in case the one we had breaks down. We don't want to borrow from others. We want our self-sufficiency. We want our independence. We want our anonymity when it comes to our resources. 
Now, I can preach about nearly any of the seven deadly sins in the book of Proverbs, and most of us can see a little bit of each of us, each one of them in each of us. The one exception is greed. Now, I've been in ministry for nearly 24 years, and I have never once had a member of my congregation come to me and admit a struggle with self-indulgence. We see it in others, but often we fail to see it in ourselves. With, with adultery, no one says, wow, oh, I had no idea I was doing that. And the same could be said for murder or theft. Jesus doesn't have to say, pay attention when it comes to most sins. Greed and materialism are exceptions to that statement. In the New Testament, other, other than the claims he makes about himself, there is no other topic that Jesus discusses more than our financial resources. For the man in our story, it was, it was too late. He would forever be a fool. And Jesus says in summarizing the man's life, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Now, the man at the beginning of the story wanted Jesus to be a divider. Tell my brother to split up my father's inheritance so I can have what is rightfully mine. Well, Jesus has come to divide, but not in the way that this man expects. Jesus is here to divide the things that matter from the things that don't. He came in part to let us know what is eternal and know what will pass away like chaff on the threshing floor. He's a judge, but not like the man wanted. In essence, Jesus is saying, I'm not here to give you the things you want most in life. I've come to be the thing you want most in life. All other desires, when made the center of your life, will become idolatry. Your faith then becomes a means to an end. Any good thing made, any good thing made the main thing will draw you away from the only thing that matters. To be rich materially while, while neglecting the eternal is foolish. Now let's take some time and examine this text in light of, of what it could mean to us today. And so I've got three points of application today. And the first is this, give not to earn salvation. Give because you have been saved. Now I want to start by saying something really, really important. If you give God your money before you give him your life, it will result in death. Now, the Pharisees, they gave, they, they, they gave 10%. They proudly gave 10% of their money down to the tiniest spice and yet remained a wicked and depraved people. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones, religious filth. They gave a tithe, but they proudly took ownership over the 90% left over. They weren't stewards. They were owners. What they failed to grasp and what the rich man in this story failed to come to terms with is the reality that our lives are on loan. We are here for a short time and then we're gone. What we have will pass through our hands and into the hands of others. When we take the posture of an owner of the 90%, our sacrifices and our offerings will often mirror pagan practices. Christianity is certainly not the only religion with a giving component, right? Pagan temples were set up on the belief that if you give to the gods, they'll give and bless you back in return. We give to get, and when we don't get back our expected return, well, our gifts then become a loan to God, placing Him in our debt. If you don't understand the gospel, this is the natural tendency of human flesh. The gospel is about giving. God gave his son. Jesus willingly gave his life. He liquidated his entire portfolio for our benefit. He gave up heaven's wealth, food, clothing, and relationships and spent it all on us. He gave up his very life, not withholding even his own blood to cover the cost of our debt to God. If this truth isn't real to you, or you only understand it on a cognitive level, you either won't give it all, you'll give out of obligation because God commands it, or you'll give to get. At the end of what is famously called the love chapter, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, but these three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now these three qualities are are the essence of who we are to become under God's new rule. To be a faithful, to be a hopeful, to be a loving people. Well, that's the goal, right? 
So why is generosity not listed? I believe it's because our generosity is connected to both, to all three. Why do we not give sacrificially? Because we lack faith. We don't trust God to provide for us or, or what he says to be true about eternal riches. How is that connected with our hope? Well, where our treasure is reveals where we place our hope. If it's in this life, a great deal of our resources will be invested here. Your checkbook will often reveal where your hope is placed. And then there's our love. Love is, love is a motivation, but it's also a generous action. James reminds us that what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister with no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day and stay warm and eat well, but you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? It's, it's, the answer is a rhetorical question. That means it, it does nothing. Now, I know this sounds simple, but gospel giving is motivated by the gospel. Now, I grew up tithing as a kid, right? Like if I, I mowed and I made 20 bucks, I gave two to the offering plate, right? When this was my habit as a child, it was easy to continue it as my income grew over time. But if you're like me, and you, you need to be careful because our generosity should not simply be a habit or grow to be just the church bill alongside the electric and the gas bill. Our tithes should be the launching point of a generous life both outside and inside the church. A generous heart is birthed out of a mature understanding of the gospel. Well, secondly, ask yourself, is your wealth drawing you deeper into community or are you becoming more isolated and independent? Now, there's a passage of Scripture that has always stumped me. And I'm going to read it for you right now. In the book of, it's in the book of Luke as well, but, but we'll be studying that later. So I'm going to read it from the book of Mark for our purposes today. In both texts, Jesus is dealing with a rich man who is at least, on the, at least on the surface looks like he wants to follow Jesus. And Jesus tells him to sell everything he owns and give to the poor, and then he'll have eternal riches. Now, everyone was shocked at the exchange, and at the end, Jesus says the following to his disciples. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the, for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution, and in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then, and those who seem to be least important now will be the greatest then. Now, I've used this text in the past to remind our church of the incredible eternal investment opportunities available to you every day in Christ's kingdom. Those who give now will have much more later. Jesus says a hundred times your initial investment. Now you're going to be hard pressed to find a return like this in any economy with the security that Christ is offering. Now Jesus doesn't speak a lot about percentages when he teaches on giving because he doesn't want to limit our opportunity to store up eternal wealth in the next life. But it's easy to get hung up on the eternal and miss the additional promise that he says here. When you give up everything for Christ, you will receive brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, and property now and eternal life in the next. Did you hear the now? Now, I'm not sure about you, but my real estate portfolio is still lacking when it comes to additional homes, right? Health and wealth preachers love this type of text because it twists, they can twist it to match their narrative. Their interpretation, though, seems a little unlikely because in the same text it says we will receive persecution, and which historically isn't a really great way to build financial security and uh, in, a, in a real estate portfolio. These texts were clear to the early church. So I think they got them immediately. But the American dream and our prosperity often dulls us to hearing what it's saying. We think in terms of properties, of sticks and bricks and roofs. 
Maybe we, we all get a piece of property on the lake. Maybe a second beachfront property on the new earth. Or, or how about a mountain cabin to go along with any private residence we might have in heaven, right? We're all for property, but most of us, want, uh, most of us don't want the additional mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, or especially mother-in-laws, right? For many of us, the whole purpose of the extra property is to escape the people that you struggle with. So what is Jesus exactly promising that we don't seem to get? Well, let me read it. Read a time after Jesus' death where these promises were becoming a reality in the church. It says in Acts chapter 2, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now, there is a house that you acquired when you came to know Christ, that you didn't even know about at the time. You know whose house that was? Mine. There's wealth that you have access to that you didn't know you had when you came to Christ. It's mine. In Christ, this room is filled with mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. We are to be a new family. I gained a family much larger than my original one. And in Christ, I have access to the help and the wealth that I never knew I had. Now, this is what Jesus was talking about. And if you're anything like me, when you comprehend this, it hits pretty hard in terms of how far practically you and I are from from really living out these truths. Some of you have come to Christ like the rich young man offering to follow Jesus, willing to do or believe whatever it takes as long as he doesn't touch your money. But now before you get mad at me, I've not even made a big deal about tithing to your local church in this sermon. In fact, I don't know that I've hardly mentioned it. If you think I have ulterior ulterior motives, give to causes outside the church. Give to the poor outside the church. This is a posture that we're supposed to have towards one another as people, not just institutions. Now, in most cultures, family is your security, your social security, and your retirement plan. A poor substitute, as our unknowing fool demonstrated in our parable today, is our money. See, the more you accumulate without generosity the more isolated you'll become. Might be a good question to ask yourself. When was the last time, now granted COVID happened, but I get, still, still think about it. When was the last time that I opened my house, my life, or my wallet to those in my Christian family? Now I'm tempted to leave you with what I just said and just let you wrestle with it and just let the silence uh, um, linger. But I don't want the weight of what I'm talking about to be silenced by a few objections. And that's that scripture actually speak to. See, in Christ, you're not an owner, but you are a manager of what you've specifically been given. When Peter condemned the actions of Ananias and Sapphira, he referred to their money as theirs to do with what they wanted. They were still the ones responsible for where the money went. Now, the Christian community is far from perfect. If you read through the epistles, you'll see Paul often set up structures to help make certain that the church's financial help didn't, get, didn't either enable laziness or abuse. In some cases, he demanded that earthly immediate families take care of their own so that the church didn't have to carry the entire burden. There's nuance in how this is lived out, but I don't want the complexity of the application or the ideal to prevent you from working towards it. Now, our last point today is this. Work on developing your eternal portfolio. Now, your witness in this life and your eternal reward in the next will be tied to what you do with the resources that God has given you in this life. Now, before you get overwhelmed by the fact that you're living paycheck to paycheck and you find that there's more month than there is money, I want to remind you that generosity is not always even connected to your money. You can be generous with your time, your home, and in ways that you serve one another. Don't be overwhelmed by your lack of what you have. We're not to bemoan what we lack, but to be faithful with what we have. 
Now, that being said, historically, our financial stewardship and generosity as a church has been one of the greatest witnesses the pagan world has ever seen. The way the church cared for their own poor, along with the poor outside the church, periodically put temples out of business. When the world saw Christians give their money away in lavish ways, they began to take note of what they were teaching more seriously. But it also secures wealth for us in the next life as well. Now, let's be cautious. Don't think in terms of paper currency, a pension, or shiny rocks. The asphalt in heaven is made out of those type of rocks. The only access that we have to anything eternal in this life is sitting right next to you. The only eternal substance that we encounter encounter on our daily lives is made of flesh and blood. You can't take it with you, but you can take them with you. Use your resources to invest in the lives of people. St. Augustine eloquently Uh, said eloquently what the unknowing fool failed to grasp. He says this, he says, he did not realize that the bellies of the poor were much safer storerooms than his barns. See, the money that we give to the poor is eternally far less volatile than the stock market. Let me end by, by getting really practical on a few ways that you might be able to apply this text today. Now, beyond a tithe, there are countless ways that you can allow your money to be available for God's uses. One might be a sponsor. Uh, one might be a sponsor to a child through compassion or world vision. There are also organizations or missionaries that you might be able to support directly. But there are also ways that you can live generously within this community. My wife and I do something, we, we call it really simple. We just call it the 1% challenge. And we set aside 1% of our income every month to be available to reaching people who don't know Jesus. Now, this may look like candy bars for the office staff at my wife's work when I need to drop something off because she may have forgotten something else at home. It could look like a bill paid, a gift card for a night out for a frazzled parents of toddlers, or flowers for a single mom on widow or widow on Valentine's Day. I had a lady on Social Security, if you're wondering how do, how do I afford this, I had a lady on Social Security at my last church who would go to thrift stores and buy newish stuffed animals and keep them in her purse. And she gave them away to children that she ran into in the lobby of, hosp- of the hospital waiting rooms while she waited for her own appointments. A- another who used her 1% to bake cookies for unbelieving neighbors. A few years back, we added another bit of money to do the same thing for those in our Christian community. It takes intentionality, but it also takes margin. It means avoiding maxing ourselves out with debt or overspending. Jesus is straightforward in his admonition regarding this. And later in Luke, he says, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you're religious, but have yet to understand the gospel... Maybe you've either tuned me out or I'm either driving you completely nuts. Or maybe you're formulating a plan to give a little more just to maybe assuage some of the guilt that's coming on. If you are, you're missing the very heart of what Jesus is trying to communicate. Don't forget this. In, in, In any of this, our generosity is connected to the degree the good news has penetrated our souls. I'm going to end with a quote by Charles Spurgeon pointing us to the origin of this type of kingdom generosity. And it's a safeguard against being an unknowing fool. He says simply, one way that you know Jesus is precious to you is that nothing else is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And God, we ask, Lord, that you will continue to do a work Lord, in, in our hearts and in our lives, let the gospel, again, Lord, not just be the one thing that we accepted that one time, but Lord, let the truth of what you have done for us continue to penetrate the depths of our soul and into our lives. And Lord, let that, oh God, let that burst forth in a lavish generosity to those both in our church family and those outside. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Sin washed white, I owe. 